AKA. I've known Rick for a long time. That's all I'm saying. So we're not going to age ourselves. Rick is an <laughs> elder law attorney. Um, what a perfect topic for this group. For anyone who works in the field of aging, you know this is a relevant topic, which is why we invite people to present, because we want to make sure that whatever we're talking about meets the needs of our entire audience. So there are a lot of changes that have occurred, will be occurring in VA. And many of you may not work as closely with some of the VA um, services and benefits. So this will definitely be helpful for you. If you have questions, you let them know how you can, yeah. how you prefer to have that done. Um, and if you guys need anything to write with or uh, paper or anything, let me know. Because so I've got some stuff in my bag. If you need to write on something. I think you've got a PowerPoint. Oh, thank you. Yes. I didn't even know that. I just looked out and I saw a PowerPoint. Yes. So, take notes and everything. Without further ado, you've got half an hour. Can you do it? <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever known an attorney you can't go a half an hour? <laughs> <laughs> now they give me a microphone, I'll never let it go. Am I going to start singing in that one? But anyways, um, first of all, thank you very much for coming in. Um, I'm going to give you a start of when we talk about the VA benefits. What I wanted to cover today was not only what's going on and what are the current rules in the VA, but there's been some proposed changes. Now, I guess the first proviso is they've been several proposed changes. Um, this is probably one of the more serious attempts by the VA to do some changes. Um, they're, you know, since they couldn't get it past Congress, they're going to try to do it on their own. Uh, we are projecting that there might be some uh, litigation because we are attorneys. Um, if in the event that the VA tries to do these changes on their own, but I think it's important um, for everyone to understand that there are some potential changes coming. Um, some of the, the ones that even if there is a challenge, I think that, that will take place, uh, there are going to be things like a look back. Uh, so we'll talk about that as we kind of go through. So first of all, I hope, you know, going back to questions, especially since I've got a little more time, I want to answer your questions as we go through this. Uh, so this is your time to ask questions, to get answers to your questions. Uh, I kind of enjoy that. Uh, for some of you who know me, I used to be a litigator. So uh, thinking on my feet was always that exciting part of doing litigation. When you're going in and doing a trial, especially a criminal trial, you get very little information, you get thrown into a trial, and, and off you go. And you're never quite sure what anyone's going to say until they say it, and then you have to adjust accordingly. Um, so that was kind of the exciting side of doing that. But it's also, like I tell people, by doing these presentations and inviting questions, I get my litigation fixed. Um, so we kind of look through all that. So now I get my clicker fixed. There we go. Um, so what is this? It, uh, the VA program that we're going to talk about today is uh, available money uh, that's tax-free for wartime veterans, but also surviving spouses of wartime veterans. Most of your VA programs uh, are going to depend upon the VA, not only that this person served in our military, but also that we're able to link whatever this disability is or physical limitation, that it goes back to his service to our country, which is something great to do because many of these, you know, these vets come back with injuries, both you know, physical and emotional, but it's also a program that attaches to surviving spouses. So it's one of the few, it's one of the only VA programs that I'm aware of that the surviving spouse can likewise benefit from the fact that she is the surviving spouse of someone who served our country during a period of war. Um, so, and naturally, the key to all of this is getting qualified. So working through the process. So, some surprising numbers. Uh, World War II vets came back. There's about 15 million who came back now. They're getting fewer and fewer because the next slide will show you some of the ages. Um, Korea, there's 1.5, which kind of is a surprising number to me when I saw that because it seems like there's a lot more than 1.5, especially when this is a national number. Um, and then the Vietnam, uh, which is often forgotten, and now they're starting to hit that age point where we're going to start to see more needs. Um, there were 3 million who returned. So when we start looking at ages, um, when you know, we start somebody coming in, you meet with them. What kind of age groups are we looking at? Normally, your World War uh, II vets, the youngest are probably going to be about 86, and the oldest are you know, um, are 91, um, who will be serving if they were you know, going into the military at the age of 18. So again, there's a little bit of flux in that, but just some of the age ranges. Um, Korean conflict is going to be people between 77 and 82. Um, again, with some flux, and also and then Vietnam. Um, which is actually a surprising number to me because I'm 55, I'm, I just missed that curve, um, fortunately. So, 
Um, I guess also the proviso is I have to tell people I never served in the military. My father did. I did not. So people come into my office and it's a common question. I said, but one of the things I have learned in about the decade I've been doing uh, veteran benefits is a profound respect for what these gentlemen did and these ladies did for our country. Um, this was this was a huge commitment. Um, it's taught me a lot to appreciate our country, to appreciate all that we have here, um, and all that's been fought for. So. So what's, what's going to be available for a uh, wartime vet? Um, if he has a spouse, we're up to $2,124 per month to help uh, reimburse for uh, um, expenses of medical care. If you have a surviving spouse, uh, $1,149 a month is the current number. That number gets adjusted every year uh, according to whatever the cost of living is going to be in Social Security. So this year, Social Security went up 1.7%. So we're, you know, so likewise the veteran benefits went up 1.7 percent. So, what are the requirements? Wartime service. Um, we've got some of the dates on my website, but if you know, we have to establish first if the person served during a period of war. Now we also tell people look at the num, look at the dates. Um, so when you go onto the website, um, I thought it was going to be a little shorter on time, so I, I, I pulled that slide out, um, but. Wartime goes farther than you think it did. Um, and also some of the unique ones is in, in, in the Vietnam era. Um, it goes all the way back to 1961 if they were in country. So it started in 1964. Um, one of the other things is as we talk about wartime veterans, and this is important for people to understand too, is you did not have to be in a theater of engagement. So many of the, you know, the benefits used to relate to them having to be in a theater of engagement. If you were a supply clerk, in Alabama during the Korean conflict, you they, they understand that that was just as much a contribution as the guy who was on the front line. The guy on the front line might have a different opinion about all of that, but you know that idea that everyone who was part of the war project um, and the war is equally important and we will recognize them all equally for this program. Then we have to establish that they need some hands-on assistance in what we call an activity of daily living, and I know I'm talking to the choir here, but those, you know, the Primarily ones we see most often are going to be, they need a shower assist, they, they need a dress assist. So most people need a shower assist or you know, also will need a dressing assist. We always come back and we remind the vet this doesn't mean you cannot do it. Because people think, well, I have to be completely unable to do it on my own. If all you need is a standby assist, because now you're unstable. You've got a, you know, a, a vet or a surviving spouse and they're on a walker. They're not real stable. And if it would be appropriate, and the doctor will confirm that it's appropriate, then we need, you know, they can use those. Um, one of the ones that the VA has used for a long, long time is meal preparation. So if they were providing that, um, I've had several of the case workers now up in, uh, in uh, Wisconsin, is where all the apps in this area go, are now no longer recognizing um, uh, when they get meal preparations. Um, it is technically an incidental act of daily activities, which is actually one of the good news that we're gonna see in all this. Um, but in the end, um, they're going to stay, they're sticking more and more at the moment to true activities of daily living. So the, the dressing, um, uh, showering, toileting, um, it's actually, you have to, you know, they need assistance in eating. So if someone's got to feed them, um, things will be looking at. So then um, once we establish a medical need, we have to have a medical expense that goes along with that need. So we tie that back in, which is going to be, could be home care. It could be assisted living. It could, uh, in fact, even if you have independent living with some add-ons, although that's again yeah, one of those areas that get a little touchy feely when you get into the VA, um, is that you know whether or not they like independent living or not. Um, and I kind of on that note, one of the things that they're trying to accomplish for these proposed changes is the term that keeps coming back: bright lines. Because one of the things about the whole VA benefit currently, with the exception of you know wartime service and that, there's a lot of not so bright lines. So there's, you know, things will fluctuate between uh, the different caseworker you might um, end up before uh, in Wisconsin. Although, as Jim will tell you, you'll never hear, me see um, anyone from the VA. It is a black box. I, tell, I call it like it's a Wizard of Oz. It's the guy behind the curtain. Um, you can submit a formal, you have the right to submit a formal request if you call uh, to the um, telephone center, which is in uh, St. Louis. Okay, well, maybe they, yeah, so, but if, if you call, you have a right to request a telephone call from the caseworker, and I promise you they will never call you back, with one exception, I've got two phone calls, and they said, 
Mr. Myers, we are pleased to tell you we've made a decision in your file. And I say, okay, well, what's that decision? They went, we can't tell you what that decision is. We're just mailing it out. But so the only time I've ever gotten a phone call from these guys is when they call and tell me they finally have decided the case. Um, the good news on that is that used to be a time period that took nine to 12 months. Um, somebody lit a fire under somebody and they've been doing these and now more the range of the two to three months. Um, I just had one this month that was under 30 days. So they did light a fire under somebody. Um, so then the other thing they're gonna look at is they're gonna look at income and assets. Um, they do a ratio and we'll touch those. But also one of the other things to understand is there are three levels to this. There's a base pension. Um, that there's a presumption that if, if, if you meet, uh, that everybody over the age of 65 is disabled. Sorry, that's the BA rule. Well, um, I'm not that far away from it. Um, homebound is in one of the other levels of this program. And uh, typically that's more of if you're not driving anymore, if you're not able to leave your home for meaningful employment would be homebound. Um, or if you need to you know, assist somebody to drive you to go places. And then the last one is the aid in attendance. Aid in attendance is when we're able to establish the, the full two ADL um, needs of assist. So, and, and each of those you'll see there's a chart we have, they pay at different rates. So we tell people if we can't fully establish two ADLs, we may still be able to qualify um, for, uh, for some benefit. Right. So, yes. Can I ask a question? Yes, absolutely. Can you go back a little bit to the 65? In this way, you were trying to explain by that. So people under 65? Once you reach the age of 65, uh, according to the VA, you are presumed to be disabled. Now you still have to have some expense care you know, going on, um, but where that sometimes comes in is, uh, the VA will typically look at the vet um, to, to look for this benefit. Now, I've got the healthy vet with the unhealthy spouse. So now that I have a spouse in assisted living or memory impaired facility, um, we can still make an application through the vet because he will be presumed to be disabled and even though the medical report will relate to the surviving spouse. No, um, not surviving spouse. I'm not saying yeah. the, the communities. Yeah, we'll go to the, the one in, the, in your community and then we can, so thank you. So then we can um, get uh, the, the base level benefit for that family um, because like I said, primarily if you're going for the aid and attendance, the full top, top level, they will always first look at the vet, then they will look at the um, surviving spouse. But if, you know, it's just it's a nice little you know a variance to the program, to where if I have the typically the wife is the first one into the institution, then we can still get some benefit to help them pay. Back back up one slide. Okay. Eight years, there we go. The little point at the bottom. The if you've got a healthy veteran but a spouse that needs care, you're not going to get aid and attendance. You're not going to get housebound, but you might get basic coverage, and that is sixteen hundred bucks. I've got this. I've got this like coming up. Tops. Yeah, but it, it's something. It's sixteen hundred bucks is nothing to sneeze at. Right. What about a young person, like an under a guy, going to automatically considered disabled? They have. Then we just have to go through the doctor's report and improve the two ADL. So if I if I've got now um, somebody who's come over from the conflict in the Middle East and now they have care needs, um, they don't have to be over 65 because none of those guys, well, not many of them are. Uh, but we can still if we get a doctor's report that proves a two hands-on needs assistance, then we can get them the aid and attendance as long as we have military service. So I, I can have a 20-year-old. We can get this program, um, although. Most of those guys, if they come back and they're that young, um, they're going to be on disability. Um, and actually, that's probably a good interesting point that's not on any of the slides, is if you're collecting a, uh, that service-related disability, so now I'm on 100% disability because of the injuries I've received during my service to the country, that's always going to be a higher rate than the aid and attendance, and you can't collect both. So, but if I've got a 10% disability, I can now add on more money for the aid and attendance. So we have to, you know, that's one of those balancing things, and that's where the consultations come in and walk the people through, um, and why the consultations take longer than, you know, the, the time I got here. You have to handle most of it because if you apply for one, they're really going to treat you as if you apply for both, and you get that benefit. 
So service requirement. First, we have to establish that you have 90 days of active duty. The exception to that is those who have served in the Gulf conflict have to establish two years worth of service. Um, you only need one of those days, during, you know, one of those active days during a period of war. Um, so it's nice to see, we, and we've had that. We had a guy who got out the day they, um, they declared the Korean conflict. And, but he got on base, and he had his one day, and you have to have something other than dishonorable discharge. So a general discharge is all you need, or better. Um, I, and, I, and I have learned in uh, both World War II and Korea, you had to really be a knucklehead to not at least get a general discharge. So, uh, but there are those out there, because we are mostly guys, and we are mostly knuckleheads. Which is a whole other presentation I do. We have to do the, now we not have to do this. Does anybody here know the last four words, or five words out of most men's mouth before disability or death? Hey, y'all, watch this. Yes. <laughs> the advanced version is, hold my beer, hey, y'all, watch this. <laughs> if it happens today, it will also be on YouTube. Yes. <laughs> So again, this is the um, over, you know, the, those presumptions, if you're over 65, you will be presumed to be disabled. Um, but primarily what they're looking for is medical expenses. They're gonna, they're gonna do a ratio. They're gonna take a look at what are the medical expenses after income. So what the VA does is they take what we know is income, because, well, for the confusion that they create is if you go to their own website, they will tell you that a surviving spouse has a maximum income of $1,149. And she'll say, well, I get 1500 from Social Security. I, I don't qualify. VA has a whole new definition of income. Yeah. They take what you and I know as any as income, any regular recurring receipt of money, so Social Security, pensions, annuity payouts. Uh, if you have somebody giving you money on a regular basis, they will count that as income. From that, they deduct the medical expenses, so the cost of home care, the cost of the facility, uh, they will deduct that. And so long as that net, that resulting number is below 1,149. So they have a term, they can, I've got a slide for that, it's called IVAP, Income for VA Purposes. So, uh, so again, the amount of pension will then depend upon what your medical needs are for the veteran or that widow. And um, so again, and this is that, that point where the disability will first be looked at through the, um, through the vet, then to the surviving spouse. Uh, the one exception to that is that we're looking for base pension. Confusing enough for everyone? Um, one other one I'll tell people is when I when I first became accredited with a VA, they tell you that you have to take a three-hour course to be, you know, to complete your accrediting. And so once they will accredit attorneys, and then within one year you have to go back and take this three-hour course. I had submitted my paperwork while I was waiting for it. I, I attended a two-day conference on this program that was down in Tampa. And went through the two days, and a week after I got back, I got my letter saying, you know, Mr. Myers, we've approved your, your application, and so I, you know, and you have one year to do three hours. So I called the VA, because they're all, they're bright line about some stuff. I said, I just got back from two days, and I sent it down to them. I said, will this count towards my three hours? And they said, no. I said, but my, my application was pending, and, he, and his exact words were, what part of after approval did you miss? <laughs> Uh, so that was one of those bright. But what I learned from that is, and I took a three-hour course that they required, and I realized how three hours of training is woefully inefficient, and, and it's just horrible to train somebody for a program as complicated as this. So I got fancy with my time on the computer here. But not as fancy as I guess I wanted to be. So what are we looking at when we talk about ADLs? Um, we're looking at inability to dress themselves, bathe themselves, a standard, what we call transfer, um, feed oneself, toileting, um, and hygiene. Um, what's actually interesting, if you go onto um, the internet and you Google ADLs, every single website I went to, after going through the first two pages of what popped up on Google, every one of them had a different category of what is an ADL, even when you went to some of the approved sites. One of the nice things that the VA is proposing to do is they can allow for what we call incidental acts of daily activities. So that's meal preparation, cleaning, house cleaning, so long as you're in a facility that is providing custodial or medical care. So if you're in full assisted living, you're getting custodial or medical care. Um, certainly if you're in a nursing home, people don't think you can use this in a nursing home, but uh, we use this program very frequently to get us through um, the penalty period arising out of transfers. So, but um, they will then look at incidental acts of daily activity. 
Although, yes? When you say providing custodial and medical care, so that's not an independent living? What they're saying is in, in, if you're in independent living, they're not going to look at incidental lines of daily living, unless we can establish that, well, an in, you know, and, uh, independent living is not ever going to be custodial care, no more, I would think. No. But if, you, if I'm in independent living with ADLs, so now I, I'm paying that extra to get a shower assist or a dress assist, I can qualify somebody for VA benefits in independent living. Even if your income come in, it's not. Not affiliated with the independent living. Well, he is providing the care, at least under the current rules. His, his providing the care can be ADL support. You can also have your kid do it. The problem that I've run into that on several occasions where I met somebody in independent living and I now have an outside this, um, source coming in, unless it appears on the same bill, so unless you bill through the facility, they won't recognize it. Because then they'll say, well, that's room and board at the independent living and you're paying for the, for the care. But if you can put it all on one one invoice, it may, you know, then then they'll accept it. It's just, those are the little quirks of this program. Um, and it's got to be mentioned in the data guard portion. Yeah. The, the, the need yes. for care yeah. from this company at this facility. Which so you doctor yeah, in fact, I know exactly where you're going. Yeah, that's because I know your place. And, uh, yes. Think, let me say one What's thing that? about this. Think of some of the independents that have their own home care, which is an outside agency, but so they act like as an employee to that home care, and that's why. Why and how that happens. Yes. I just want to be sure I understand this correctly. So if I'm a senior veteran with ADL and I live in a senior <coughs> citizen independent living apartment and I'm getting to the point where I need someone to come in, but I don't want to give up my my apartment yet. I cannot qualify unless the apartment bills Unless it all appears on one bill, right? Because they'll treat it as if you were still in your home, and, and when you're at your home, whether it's in a, a truly a, a separate um, from a senior community where you're in an apartment or you're in your house, then they will only look at what your care expenses for the people coming in are. So they don't look they don't look at living expenses when they add all, all these expenses up. It's for unreimbursed medical expenses, and, that, okay. and that's all. But if I'm in my own home still, yes. I would be all right to, to apply and probably, hopefully, get approved. So long as you're you're actually paying someone for your care. Uh -huh. and, and the reason I say this, you know, now we have someone like um, Tom's come out and provide that care. His company, um, Home and Senior Senior Care, is always is going to provide an invoice. Um, now, just wait till the kids. Just because you're kids doesn't mean you're slaves. So if I have the children providing care. Then we um, we can have them do that, but we do that through a care contract. And I tell them you have to be paid. I have if they if they send this in and I have I get audited, I have to be able to prove that the children were being paid. Right. So we normally set the and, and the reason that's nice is we can use the children. Isn't that the model we want to foster at least in the start when we've got somebody with some basic <laughs> needs? Um, but the kids are going to start. They're going to curtail their time at work. So. They should be um, compensated for that loss in income. Yes. An analogy between a, a home care in an independent living or home care at your residence is, if you get home care at your residence, he is not going to worry about your electric bill, your gas bill, your food bill. They're going to look at your home care expenses because they're never going to appear on the same invoice. Okay. So if you can get cooperation in the independent facility, independent living facility. And when you say, hey, this will help them pay for, this will help your resident pay for the apartment, you're happy to get some cooperation there. Um, they can at least all be packaged on the same bill. But at least logically, your room and board at Infant Living is just like your gas bill, your food bill, and you still got a mortgage, a homeowner association bill. That has nothing to do with your care. If you've got to get some cooperation, it's going to be packaged up right, and this is not an independent living, should not, if you're trying to get independent living covered, do not try to get to your veteran service commission or your American Legion because they will never figure that out. They'll never get it right. So who do you get from? Now we're a law attorney. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, 
we, you know, and that's, that's part of what we do is we, we make sure that that package is put together completely as we submit it uh, so that it's in, it's in the form that they want. You know, they do really weird stuff. If, if I send something on my letterhead, the procedure is, and this is their procedure, and so it's by rule, you take the file, you put it with my letter, and whatever was contained with my letter, and you set it aside for three weeks. They're not allowed to look at it. After three weeks, they take it to the desk of the caseworker, they put it on the desk, and the caseworker now is not allowed to touch the file for another three weeks. So if I put something on my letterhead, and close, please find it's an automatic six-week delay in the application process. I put it on their form, the exact same words, on a statement of support claim, no delay. Weird, quirky stuff. That's what the VA is all about. It's the military. Put it on my form. If it ain't on my form, I don't know what to do with it. So, and, and put it in the format I know and understand. Because if it isn't, I don't know what to do with it. Got it. It's wizard of us. So, some of the other changes that are coming up, hopefully, are my slide. <coughs> Um, home, just a quick explanation of homebound. Again, um, can't leave the house without assistance. Doesn't mean uh, they can't take care of themselves in the house, but if they're not able to go out, and certainly if they surrender their driver's license, that would qualify them for homebound. And this is how we determine, yes? They can't drive. Does that have to be like doctor approved? Or uh, shouldn't drive, can't drive. <laughs> Normally you're going to look for something that says they shouldn't drive. So it, it's, it's got to be an independent recommendation. And that's. Um, they can put that on the medical report. The nice thing is the medical report that the VA wants is they don't want a fancy letter by your doctor. They've got a two-page form, a 2680, fill it out. Don't try to hand them a bunch of other stuff. Um, put it on their nice, simple form, and the doctors understand that. They, and they, it's wonderful. The facilities and the, and the medical providers turn those around in a day. So what are we looking at? This is what I talked about when we come up for IVAP. You take your gross household income, and it's, so if I've got a married couple, we take a look at both of their incomes. If I have children living in the home, dependent children living in the home, their income counts. So you have to be careful when you have home care by the children on whether or not they're living at the house. That's one of the areas they're trying to clarify and actually um, in a non-positive way for, the, uh, for those people applying. Then you take a look at your out-of-pocket medical expenses. So it has to be out-of-pocket. So if you have long-term care insurance, which congratulations, good for you but that gets added on his income. So it has to be unreimbursed medicals, and that's when you come up with um, IVAP income for VA purposes. Um, if, you're, if that IVAP is negative, you get the full benefit, boom. Um, so if I've got you know $2,000 in, in income, and I've got a $4,000 expense, that's a negative 2,000, you will get the full benefit. So if the full benefit is $2,100, they don't care that you're, you know, you're out of pocket for 2,000, they give you the full benefit. If you're out of pockets, you know, you, that shortfall is 1,000. You still get the full benefit. So it's, it's a nice program. So for some people, they actually come ahead of it, ahead of the game, depending upon uh, care expenses and income. Mm -hmm. There we go. Um, again, these slides are in there, but these are the rates. Um, so if I've got base pensions and I've got that person in the community, I can get up to 12,000, you know, so I now have the, the wife in the facility and the, and the veteran is in the community, we can still get that family about $13,000 a year to help pay for that care. I'm sorry, it would be 16,000 because they would then have a dependent. So, and this is, these are the rates for a surviving spouse. So again, it's a nice award. It's, uh, and what's nice is the VA puts it in their bank account. So it's just like your social security. As we fill out the application, we tell them which bank account we want that to go into. And then once they make the award, it, they electronically deposit that into their account. Um, if you want a check, you have to tell them you do not have a checking account. You have to sign an affidavit. You have to sign and swear that you don't even have a bank account. Because they don't want, they want to do it electronically. Uh, the one except, that's, that's a big cost savings to the government. Right. Well, and the other thing is, um, if now if there's a competency issue, so now I have somebody with dementia, there's a diagnosis they can't manage their own personal affairs, the VA then will automatically um, appoint someone to be the designated payee. So it'll be one of the children typically, um, and that will cause for a little bit of delay. But the nice thing is the VA will go back to the month after, to, to back to the month following application. So, 
common misunderstanding. Everybody thinks I can have eighty thousand dollars and apply for VA benefits. There, that is, that is not the rule at all. Um, with the VA, it's, it's far more. You know, they can't make it that easy. It's far more complicated than that. <clears throat> we have to take a look at when we go back to that term IVAP. So now if I have a negative IVAP, so that means that's how much I have to go to my savings every month. Will I theoretically exhaust the life savings of that applicant? Given the, you know their age and, and Social Security life expectancy, um, if, if the answer to that is yes, I qualify. The number eighty thousand appears is if they deny a file and the applicant has less than eighty thousand dollars in resources. There's an additional form that they have to fill out to explain to them why they were denied. Um, that's the only reason eighty thousand. For some reason, the popular you know the consensus is that that's a number. Um, if you talk to these VA organizations, they'll tell you eighty thousand. I tell people the 75 year old can have far more than the 95 year old. So if I've got somebody in their 90s, they now have a life expectancy of one year, I probably have to take those guys all the way down pretty deep to maybe $10,000, $20,000 worth of resources. Um, the nice thing on the proposed rules is they will get bright lines. The current proposal is they will look at the, that Medicaid number and they will give everybody the right to have $119,220. That number will be adjusted. Um, I thought that was actually one of the nicer things they were doing for people. Yeah, their number. Yeah, that's probably about the only one. So, whether that one actually gets through or not, and, and that number, one hundred and nineteen thousand two hundred and twenty, would be adjusted every year to the cost of living. <coughs> so, here's the big change. Currently, currently, the VA has no look back. Right? Tell people they have a one day look back. So I have somebody, and, and I figure that they can have thirty thousand dollars worth of assets. They have one hundred and thirty. We can move 100,000 typically into a trust, and then if we put it into the trust, we can apply the next day. We have no look back. We just have to make sure that those transfers are completed before we submit that application. The current rules is they are going to look at a three-year look back, so they will audit every current proposal. The current proposal is a. Um, I'm sorry, I, I was I went back. I was changing everything to proposal. The new the proposed rule will be a three-year look back, and what they will do is they will stop and they will take a look and say, what, what, benefit, what amount of benefit would they have received? And that now becomes what we call the divisor. So if I, the example would be, if I give away um, $76,000 for a married couple, that will create a three-year waiting period. So, and, that, and the waiting period they're, they're proposing will be unlimited. So again, that becomes the caution. The point of this is getting ahead of the curve. You're getting the seniors in, starting to do some of this repositioning, earlier than the admission into the facility, or as soon as they get in, getting them in. Now, I don't know how many times have people come in and they've been in a senior community and they didn't, you know, they didn't want to make that, you know, the time to meet with an elder law attorney and they burned through all the money and now they're applying. And so applying early is, is much better. Yes. I want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly because I have to talk to my uncle this weekend. And maybe 30 years ago, he put all of his assets three years from the point of application, so that's a good question. So when you submit the application, now the nice thing is, if I give assets away, the, the penalty period starts from when I give it away. So if I'm giving away more than 76,000, I don't have to wait three years, but if I give away, I can give away substantially more than that, um, or if I give away less than that, so now I only have to give away, you know, 30,000, then I can, my penalty starts when I give it away. But the other side of this is it depends on the type of trust. If you set up a trust 30 years ago, it well could be a revocable living trust. And if he retained those those authorities, the power to modify it or, the, the, or even to be the trustee, that trust doesn't do anything to help him for VA benefits. The, the program requires that it's a complete divestment, and that becomes a stumbling block. Right. And it's one of the reasons I like to use a trust, is if I take the money and give it to the kids, and now if, if they get sued, 
you know, Disney, you can tell Disney all day long, that's my parents' money, but he will make them pay. And so, you know, the plaintiff's attorneys aren't going to stop. They're going to say, it's in your name, your social security number, your money. What happens when the kid gets sick and goes into the nursing home? Medicaid's going to say, your name, your social security number, your money. And we've had that happen. So, yes? No, um, that's a social security rule. Uh, if you're married 10 years and you're guaranteed you're going to get some of his social security, if you divorce, you're done. The, you, know, you are not a surviving spouse of a wartime veteran. So, and they don't care why you got divorced. He could have been the most vicious individual on the planet. And if you divorce him because he was physically abusive, they don't care. You're out. You are not a surviving spouse of a wartime veteran. That's a social security rule. I think there may be some other VA benefits that might be available, especially if you've got a child together, but this one is not available to the overseas. So I've got just a few more slides and then we'll be done. Uh, but again, well, these, these are in there. If you um, you've got to be the widow, you're not divorcing with that one. The other big changes is, um, again, unlimited penalty period is the potential. Um, here's the other one. All transfers are presumed improper. You give money, you give money to the building fund at your place of worship, that's an improper transfer for the VA. There is no, you know, rebuttable presumption. There's no hardship rule in the, what they've done. Um, penalty starts on the month of transfer. It's um, transfers of assets. Oh, here's the other big one. Because annuities were big use in VA benefits. A lot of people are saying, I take the money and put it into an annuity. The VA is proposing to do exactly what Medicaid did. You want to put your money into an annuity, we are going to punish you severely for that. So annuity usage and VA planning is not going to work at all anymore. They will treat whatever you put into the annuity as an improper transfer. Um, Which stinks because that might be what you need to fill the gap between what VA yeah. is going to give you and your actual home. Right, and that's that's a problem with this whole look back. Um, for home rates, what, what will we pay for home care? Um, they will look at the MetLife rates. Uh, MetLife does a MetLife insurance does a publication every year, and that's the maximum rate that they will allow uh, home care to be charged. And the other one is the residence. Currently, the residence is, is exempt. They will, they're going to limit the residence to the house and two acres. So farmers are really going to get it on this one. So that's another big proposed change. That's probably one of the big areas we're trying to fight. Somebody live in a nice house and five acres a lot. And you, yep. The, the, the thing that really gets me about the look back, three times Congress has considered creating a look back within the VA law for, for pension. Three times it's been voted down, and now VA's trying to adopt something. Yep. Who can we write letters to and tell them that's a ratty way to treat veterans? Well, actually, the uh, opinion writing period ended, unfortunately, for this proposal on March 24th of this year. Oh. So, but yeah, there's a lot of people written out. The other side of it is there are several organizations that have promised litigation, saying that the VA isn't empowered. That's what Congress is supposed to do. When you just go back to basic civics that you study, Congress is supposed to make the laws and make the rules, and not these organizations making up their own. You know, God help us if the if the Internal Revenue Service ever did that. Um, so well, that's the danger. Anyway. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and these guys make up enough of their own rules. As an authorized representative, it says I am empowered to prepare, present, and prosecute a claim. I am not allowed to say boo in an application. If they want income verifications, if my client doesn't sign the statement in support, and all I'm saying is attached, please find their you know, W-2s and, and social security, they won't accept it. Um, until, and then they'll threaten to deny it because we didn't respond. There, it's uh, weird, quirky rules. I asked them to cite the reg and they said, that's our policy. I said, I don't give a rat's keister about your policy. I want to know the rule. I'm an attorney. I can pre I can prepare and present the stuff, and your thing says I have the right to present. They said we don't care what our what our forms say. <laughs> They're weird. So, to, in closing, the point of all this is starting early, making sure that, that clients are getting ahead of the curve, making sure they've got even a basic plan with a with a good solid um, power of attorney, um, and a good power of attorney, for, especially for a veteran, is going to include the authority to go get their DD-214 from the recorder's office. A lot of them have them recorded, and there's only four people in the world that are allowed to get that. The vet himself, a funeral director to assure military honors, 
somebody who is pay, a paid employee of the VA, good luck getting them to do anything for you, and somebody specifically authorized by the vet to secure their DD-214. If you've listened to that list, the surviving spouse is not on that list. A surviving spouse is not entitled to, to secure their their husband's DD-214, which they need to apply for this benefit. But and it's a protected document. Yeah. can't go get it. Yeah, so if he's passed away, he, he can't authorize anyone to go or get it. Bed bound. And if you all keep a secret, they think I work for the VA downtown, so I get to record those. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm down there a lot recording them for vets. So they, they asked me the one day, said, do you work for the VA? I said, I'm accredited with the VA. They took that as a yes. I'm taking it as a yes. I don't know. And I'm running with it. So, which, that's our secret. Um, so again, healthcare powers of attorney, living wills, making sure things are HIPAA compliant. Uh, and last will and testament, then uh, what I call a quality of life trust. Um, and the reason I call it that is I want the kids to understand during the life period of the vet and the surviving spouse, this ain't your money. This is their money. This isn't your time to go on vacation. It's not inheritance preservation. It's not inheritance advancement. This is about putting aside a fund to meet the quality of life issues for your parents through the rest of their life. Um, so making sure the safeguards are on there so the kids can't build it. So with that, I know we're running real, real tight on time. So thank you.